Good morning. Good morning. I think we have just found the solution to post-COVID worship attendance. <laughs> A special meeting of the congregation. <laughs> I welcome all of you on this very, very special day here at Living Waters Lutheran Church. Um, today we, for those of you who are listening online, have just voted unanimously as a congregation to call a new pastor. Uh, from Wapaton, North Dakota. Pastor, he goes by the name of Jake Dryhog. And uh, Deerhog, Deerhog, Deerhog. Got to get that right. Um, and uh, for those of you who came to be part of this uh, very, I would say, momentous vote, a very timely vote, uh, thank you for your presence today because it is a witness to the power of God's Spirit working in and through the membership of this congregation and this congregation within the greater community. So thank you to all of you. Uh, give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> this morning we start a very special journey. It is Palm Sunday. And the accolades that come to Jesus we know change over the course of about five days. Those who cheer him, it doesn't take long for them to begin to mock and deny and demand his crucifixion. Um, their path, in many ways, is our path. We have those same kinds of responses, those same kinds of emotion. Um, we enter this week praying that we might be of the same mind of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we know that we need the Spirit's help to do that. We accompany Jesus to the cross, not only with grief, but we also do so post-Easter with thanksgiving, because we can now trust in our hearts that God's redeeming love for us is real. And it is in that spirit that we gather here today. A couple of announcements to call to your attention. I don't have them written down, so I'm going to have to read them off the screen like the rest of you. First of all, a reminder that our uh, Holy Week services are, have begun today. Monday, Thursday service with Holy Communion. That's First Communion for the uh, young people in our congregation. A 7 o'clock service. A 7 o'clock service on Good Friday, um, where we go through uh, the crucifixion and we hear the last, the last words of our Lord. An Easter vigil, 8.30 p.m. on Saturday evening, and then three Easter services, all of them uh, in person, um, 7, 8.30, and then 10 a.m. in person and online also. So uh, please note that and pass that information on to your, uh, to your friends. On Good Friday, we're going to have a food drive, dropping off food donations here at the church. Our goal is to fill this entire chancel area with food as we did uh, back in the day, <laughs> uh, earlier, actually earlier this year. Uh, we are uh, low on food supplies. If you look back at the food shelf, uh, shelves back there, they are, they're a lot of wire and not a lot of stuff. So uh, we're counting on, on this to take place. Uh, items needed, you can see there. We're also collecting help for Good Shepherd. Um, their crafts department is asking that we do what we can to assist them in uh, providing materials for the residents of the Good Shepherd community. So keep those in mind as you, uh, as you go through uh, this week. And finally, I want to say thank you to our technology team. 
We've got Patsy in the back room. We've got Tim and Brenda on the piano this morning. Our musicians, Jan Anderson, Max Fortner on drums, Paul Martinson on bass, uh, Jeff Moon and Jen Keywell uh, providing vocal uh, leading for our worship service today. At this time, I would uh, invite all of the children to uh, get ready to come forward. Not, not, we're going to go through a little call to worship, but just to get ready, we're going to meet up here. Actually, we're going to meet in the back, and we're going to get palms, and we're going to start a palm procession while the congregation sings a hymn. And then at the end of that procession, we're just going to stay up front for a short children's message. Now, it's not just the little kids that I'm looking for. Anybody who's a child at heart who wants to be part of that palm procession, uh, please come forward. Come. From the city streets, join the happy throng that gathers to honor Jesus. Come from your busy homes and places of business. Put down your work in joyful celebration. Come, lay down your sorrows and worries. Turn your eyes toward the Savior whom God has sent. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the Jesus Christ who comes in the name of name. Amen. We sing all glory, laud, and honor as the children gather in the back for the palm procession, and then we will stay up front for the children's message.
Well, thank you so much for being part of the palm procession this day. It's a tradition in Christian churches all around the world that people wave their palms and they walk around and parade and uh, they shout Hosanna. Do you know what the word Hosanna means? Any ideas? Any ideas? We say, we say Hosanna, that's a praise word, yes. The actual meaning is, save us now. When the people were waving their palms, they were saying, Jesus, save us now. They had this idea that Jesus was going to save them. But you know what happened? Within five days, those same people that were waving their palms were saying, crucify him. Crucify him. See, Jesus was about to save them from something that I'm not sure they wanted, or they wanted, or they needed, but they didn't know they needed it. They thought Jesus was going to be their political savior, their king, their president. But he came to save them from their sins. Now I want to tell you something about these palms that happens in many churches around the world. Many churches on, after Palm Sunday, they, they gather up all the palms and they put them away and they let them dry up, turn brown. Some of them stay green, but they dry up, crispy, crunchy. And then, after a long time, they burn them up in a fire. They burn them in a fire and, and they smash the ashes into tiny little bits. And you know what they do with the ashes? They use the ashes for the Ash Wednesday service. They mix them with a little bit of oil and they put the sign of the cross on people's forehead on Ash Wednesday as a reminder that this Jesus who we praise today is the Jesus who saved us by dying for our sins on a cross. And the ashes are a reminder of what he was willing to do for us because he loved us. So, let's pray. Remember how we do that? Let us pray. Loving God, loving God, we thank you that your love is greater than our ability to disobey. That your love is greater than our ability to disobey. Keep us in your love. And walk with us every day of our lives. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. You can take those palms, yes, take them home, but don't burn them, okay? As we begin the holiest of all weeks for the baptized in Christ, we confess our part in the crucifixion of Jesus. It was necessary that he die for the sins of the world. That includes my sin. We confess our sin. For any hesitancy to stand with Jesus when he was in need and me, for any forgetfulness on my part for the gifts Jesus has given. As we follow Jesus into this week, the need of the forgiveness shown by God's great love for us on the cross. Holy and gracious God, 
I confess that I have sinned against you. I am part of the sin of the world for which you gave your life. Some my sin I know, the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed, but some is unknown to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask for forgiveness. In Isaiah we read, It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? In Philippians we read, Being formed in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. It is because of this obedience and sacrifice that in the name of Jesus our sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remembering you are a child of God, please make the sign of the cross on your forehead. from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughters of Zion, Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees said to them and to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servants be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. The word of the Lord. Some of you may not even know who I am. Um, I'm Wayne Anderson. I'm a retired pastor, a member of this congregation. Um, when I was in high school, I did not uh, intend, it was not my intention to be a minister. I was going to be a high school history teacher because I loved history and I liked the way my history teachers in junior and senior high taught history. And so over the years, I have been a bit of a history buff. I won't say I'm a, a history scholar by any stretch of that imagination. But I 
do like to read about American history. Uh, some time ago there was a book written about Woodrow Wilson. And if you remember, Woodrow Wilson was president at the very end of World War I. And when that war ended, he was a world hero. There was a great spirit of optimism because people believed that the last war, world war, had been fought and the world was now safe for democracy. But the cheering didn't last very long for President Wilson. It lasted about a year, at which time the Allies in Europe began to focus on their own agendas as nations. At home, there were divisions in the Congress. About two years after the beginning of his presidency, or not even two years, a little over a year, President Wilson had a stroke. His party was defeated in the midterms, and so it was that President Woodrow Wilson, a man who barely a year earlier had been heralded as a messiah in the world, came to the end of his days as president, a broken man. A sad story, absolutely. But one that has been repeated throughout all of history. The ultimate reward, oftentimes, for someone who tries to translate ideals into reality, ends in frustration and defeat. Isn't that the way it happened with Jesus? He emerges from the public scene. He's an absolute sensation. The crowds follow him. He can't even get away at times when he needs to be alone to pray. They follow him by foot. They follow him by boat. And when he is alone, the 12 disciples continue to pester him. What did you mean, Jesus, they would ask him. On Palm Sunday, the leafy palm branches that we witnessed here this morning were spread before him. People lay their coats on the ground for his procession to walk over. Save us now, they were shouting. Highly charged religious and political expectations covered covered the crowd. But we all know the cheering didn't last very long, did it? There came a point when the tide began to turn against him. Subtle at first, but it was there. And the opposition began to snowball into a mob that ended shouting, crucify him, crucify him. We want the Messiah. But not always do we want what the Messiah seeks to bring. Why did the masses turn against him? How did the shouts of Hosanna turn to crucify him? I think those are questions we all need to ask ourselves. Because they lift up very deep and underlying issues. In five short days, everything falls apart. And I think it's important that we try to wrap our heads around how that happens. Because it happens to us and in us too. I'm convinced that one of the reasons this cheering stopped for Jesus was because he began to talk more and more about commitment. During the last weeks of his life, a very interesting scene occurs. We read a little portion from John's Gospel today, but I would really encourage you as a part of your Lenten discipline this week is to look at the Holy Week writings in each of the four Gospels. They point to different things. There are different things that they lift up, but they make the complete story. One of those stories that happens early on as a rich young ruler comes to Jesus 
You're familiar with the dialogue that takes place. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what does Jesus say? <laughs> Go sell everything that you've got. Give it to the poor and then follow me. There was probably nothing that would stun the masses more. They were troubled for theological reasons, first of all. They had been raised to believe that God specifically bless and blesses those who are rich. And here Jesus is turning away good money. They were also instinctively thinking, as we instinctively think, that success in this world will lead to success in God's kingdom. And it bothered them to see Jesus turn away this rich man because they all wanted to be like him. They were bothered for a second reason. Prior to this, in ministry, Jesus was all about grace. He was feeding 5,000 people. He was healing those who came before him. A woman caught in adultery and about to be stoned is forgiven, set free from her punishment. Grace upon grace upon grace. But in Holy Week, for the most part, the miracles are over. The one miracle that's actually lifted up and identified is when Peter whacks off the ear of Melchus, the slave, and Jesus heals him. There are other mentions of people bringing the sick and the lame and those who needed healing to him, but it is in passing, nothing specific. On the face of it, that might not seem significant. But when a third of the gospel narratives are focused on the last week, the last week in the life of Jesus, then you begin to understand the importance of the fact that the miracles are not so much part of that life anymore. While there are few miracles recorded, you will find a persistent and consistent call to commitment. The greatest commandment is given. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. A clarion call. A clarion call to commitment. And I think it's safe to assume that the host of uncommitted people at that point walked away. They've had enough. I'm not just talking about the immediate events that may have brought this about, but the deeper causes, the deeper issues. People were not wanting the kind of commitment that Jesus was calling for. Because at this point in his ministry, Jesus is saying, now that you've got it, what are you going to do with it? And isn't that, isn't that what we are about as the body of Christ? Now that we have God's grace, God's love, God's forgiveness, and God's hope surrounding us and everybody else, what are we going to do with it? You and I, we, we cannot have a king. We cannot have a king Jesus without a loyalty and a commitment to follow the king and what the king teaches. Secondly, I think the cheering began to stop when Jesus dared to suggest that all people, all people are worth loving. First thing Jesus does after the Palm Sunday entry into Jerusalem, he goes into the temple, and what does he do? Chases out the money changers. But we forget that after he chases out the money changers in Matthew's Gospel, he invites in all the poor, the lame, those who couldn't be there, technically. 
He dares to bring them into the church. And by bringing these people in, it's his way of saying that all people have access to this grace that I'm about to give you. That the kingdom of God is going to look like this. A ragtag bunch of people. Not united, not looking alike, not being homogenous, except for one thing. They are all loved by God. I can't help but notice the chain of events as Jesus comes into Jerusalem. A beggar, beggar calls out to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the response of this crowd is, tell him to shut up. And then Jesus makes his triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. And who are the ones that are lifting up his praise? The children. The children are shouting out. And the Pharisees say, what do they have to say with it? And Jesus says, you know what? They've got it right. If I tried to... If I try to quiet them, the very stones that are on the ground will shout out my praise. There's a beautiful, beautiful image in Special Olympics. Nine children line up for a 100-yard dash. The gun goes off, and they head toward the finish line. But within 10 yards, one of the children falls down. These special Olympians did not understand the world's concept of competition and getting ahead and taking advantage of any situation that will help you. The other eight children all stopped in the race, came back, surrounded the fallen racer, lifted him up, and then together, arm in arm, Cross the finish line. The audience raises, raises in applause, and there's not one winner, but there are nine. For a fleeting moment there, we have a picture of what the kingdom of God is like. It challenges the world's concept that first place is everything. In the race that we are in as the body of Christ, everyone matters. Everyone. Particularly those who, are, who have fallen and are outside. Outside the, bond, the bounds of our limits. The cheering stopped, yeah, because Jesus opened the door of the church to everyone. Proclaimed that everyone matters didn't sit well with many people, just like it does not sit well with many today. And finally, I would suggest to you that the cheering stopped because Jesus began to talk more and more about the cross. Early parts of his ministry, it's about healing, it's about kingdom. But at the end, it's about sacrifice, giving up your life, Little League coaches have a story they like to tell to each other, kind of a, a complaining story that, you know, coaches don't listen to very much. The ball game, the little guy gets up to bat, the coach on third base gives him the sign, and the sign is to bunt. Well, the little tyke at the plate, three pitches later, has had three mighty swings and struck out. And the coach runs up to him and he says, didn't you see me give you the bunt sign? The little boy said, yeah, but I didn't think you meant it. <laughs> Isn't that what we say to God? Yes, Lord, I hear all that talk about sacrifice, but 
do you really mean it? And the cross says emphatically, he did mean it. Without the cross, everything that Jesus said and did would have been a vicious lie, a deception of eternal proportions. I began this sermon asking the question, why did the cheering stop? It stopped because more and more people heard Jesus talking about commitment. It stopped because Jesus opened the doors to everyone and invited all to come in. And most importantly, I believe it stopped because Jesus would not stop talking about the cross. There is another side to the Hosanna. Had the cheering not stopped, had the cheering gone on, then we would be, like Paul says, the most pitied of all people. Because the story doesn't end with the palms. It doesn't end with the parade. It moves on to betrayal. It moves on to denial. It moves on to death on a cross and resurrection. And that, that is the side of Hosanna that gives us hope, purpose, with the presence and the power of God around us always. Thanks be to God. Amen. Together in trust and hope, we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We cry for your help, O God, praying for the church, the world, and all those who are in need. Loving God, draw us close to your heart. As we offer these prayers, we pray for your church, called to follow Jesus in the way of the cross. Make us unflinching servants of the gospel. Deliver us from hardship as we confront the forces of injustice and practice radical compassion. Lord, in your mercy. For all the earth and its inhabitants, created in love, train us to recognize your divine goodness and presence in the world around us. Rouse in us a reverence for creation that we take greater care of all of the resources that you have given us. Lord, in your mercy. For those in positions of authority who are called to lead, we pray that you would fill them with integrity and compassion. Supply them with courage and vulnerability. Deliver them from fear that limits imagination and impedes justice. Lord, in your mercy. Today we pray for those who suffer, waiting expectantly for mercy, for consolation, for healing. Accompany those who feel abandoned or betrayed. Defend those who are wrongly accused. Embrace those who are detained and incarcerated. Heal those who are ill, especially those whom we name in our hearts before you. Lord, in your mercy. Today we remember those who have been called to their eternal rest, and we ask your blessing upon their surviving families. Today, we remember Ellen Howe as she grieves the death of her daughter, Diane. We commend them all to your care, Lord. Remember each of us and remind us that you have prepared a place for us. Lord, in your mercy. Today, we offer a special word of prayer that you would be with Pastor Charles Deerhog. Be with him as he makes his decision, as he responds to the call of this congregation to serve. But we would also ask that you would be with the congregation that he is currently serving as they adjust to these possible changes. We ask his blessing And we ask your blessing now and blessings and thanksgiving for the call committee and the transition team that have prepared the work for this call. May their work bear fruit according to your abundance. Lord, in your mercy. Now is the acceptable time to offer our prayers to you, God of grace and truth. Receive them in your mercy and grant us all that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. At this time, I would ask that you would share the peace with those around you. Do it in a socially distanced way, if that's what you're comfortable with, a peace sign. We continue with our communion liturgy. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, 
but with words of grace and life. Bless us and these gifts which we receive from your bounty. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to all to drink, saying, Drink all of it. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come. The table is prepared. All are welcome. No one is excluded. I invite the communion assistants to come forward at this time. Uh, I will need five. Um, a reminder that the bread that you will receive is uh, gluten-free. If you uh, have other allergies, uh, there is a wafer that will be available in the front. The first chalice will be the wine. The second chalice, which is metal, will be grape juice. Come forward, come as you are, receive God's blessing.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Merciful God, accompany our journey through these 40 days. Renew us in the gifts of baptism that we may provide for those who are poor. Pray for those in need. Fast for self-indulgence. And above all, that we may find our treasure in life. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Go forth in hopefulness. Sitting in presence. Christ is here. Go forth in reflectiveness, remembering how quickly we change. We reject tomorrow the one whom we embrace today. Still, go forth in stillness of heart, knowing that God is with us. The suffering is not in vain. We sing our concluding song, My Song is Love Unknown. Don't be concerned that there are seven verses in the bulletin. We are going to be singing verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. Thank you very much. peace and thanksgiving and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.